This is Nick Riqueda, and you're listening to a Sunset Sea production. It's better than whiskey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 29 of the Imperial Tides podcast. Uh, I'm Holden, and I'm joined today by Simone, and today we're going to be talking about uh, the sixth part of uh, 14 total parts in the uh, West German 1980 television miniseries slash like 15 hour long film, uh, Berlin Alexander Platz. And uh, today's episode is uh, called episode six is titled Love Always Has Its Price. And I think it's appropriate considering that we expand in this episode, we expand more upon the the, the whole arc with uh, the character that was introduced in the previous episode, Reinhold, whose problem, he's a, he's a compulsive womanizer and he's obsessed with women. And he, he has this weird issue where it's like he, he's obsessed with getting them, but then as soon as he gets them, the, the relationship stales and he wants to get rid of them as soon as possible. You know, so he has this weird love, hate, like, you know, compulsive thing going on, the psychosis, romantic sexual psychosis that he, he's dealing with. And so in the previous episode, he, he, he met friends at the bar. They sort of kick it off a little bit. They become friends, hit it off. They become friends and uh, friends basically agrees to take all of the women that, uh, Reinhold no longer wants and kind of just, you know, have them as girlfriends basically. And so it's this weird system that they have. It, go, it happens twice. It goes through two cycles. But then um, when uh, Reinhold wants him to do a third one, Franz gets, you know, a bit hesitant about it. He doesn't feel good about it morally or whatever. And so that episode ended with Franz and Silly, who was the second girl, second girlfriend that basically, that, that Reinhold basically gave him, Franz, uh, they both decide to talk to Trude, who is the third girlfriend that was supposed to be passed over to, to Franz. That's what they said they would do at the end of the uh, last episode. But in this episode, it worked out a little differently. Uh, Franz still confronts Reinhold about the whole, you know, pimping, whatever you, you want to call it, situation. But instead, it's not him and Silly, and they don't talk to Trude at all. It's more, it, it, it's just Franz confronts Reinhold in the, the men's room at the bar at the very beginning of the episode. It plays out a little differently than how they set it up in the previous part, but it's still the same thing happens. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But um, as always, we start these uh, you know, episodes with a quick summary of what happened in the, the show or the movie, right? And so just to give you guys a brief little you know, uh, play-by-play, um, in this episode, uh, Franz, basically, Franz and Reinhold, they, they have a falling out because... Um, Franz decides not to take Trude off Reinhold's hands as he had initially sort of agreed to, right? Um, Reinhold, and, and because of this, Reinhold essentially disowns him. And so they stop, there's like a wench that's thrown into their pretty uneasy friendship, but now it's kind of soured a bit, right? It's not as uh, harmonious as it used to be. There's some animosity, um, especially from, from Reinhold's part. Reinhold is very bitter about this. He takes it very seriously. Um, so yeah. Uh, after that, uh, friends at home, he has a, a nightmare while sleeping with Silly, where he, he transforms into various animals and is ultimately um, eaten by Reinhold in snake form. So Reinhold is a snake. I think uh, Franz, he turns into a bird or something, and he can't fly away from Reinhold as he slithers up this tree that he's sitting in to, to eat him. And um, yeah, and then he also wakes up the, the morning after that hearing ringing bells outside that aren't actually there. And um, when he goes out to investigate them to see if they're, they're actually happening or not, he comes across a, a fight between two men in the street, right? And um, and one of those men is named uh, uh, Bruno, and Franz actually knows him uh, because Bruno works for Pums, who is uh, Mech's boss, who we were introduced to in the previous episode. He's uh, He's got some fancy clothes and stuff, and he, he apparently works in the fruit business, right? That's what he says. Um, and so Bruno asks Franz uh, to tell Pums the boss, that Bruno will not be able to work that night. And so then after that, Franz proceeds to pay a visit to Pum's apartment and deliver the news. Uh, and he does, but then um, he, he sort of haphazardly is, is offered five marks an hour, which is a lot, especially for the times, you know, the economy's down and all that. Um, he's, he's basically five bucks an hour to fill in for Bruno uh, for the night. And and Franz is hesitant about this, but when... Um, when Reinhold himself sort of, you know, enters the room for his briefing from Pums, because he also works for Pums in the fruit business, right? Um, Franz is in instantly reassured. Um, probably not, in his, you know, probably not, probably not the best call to make, but he, he feels comfortable now that, you know, 
knowing that, uh, uh, for whatever reason, knowing that Reinhold would be there, even though they've had a bit of a fight or whatever. Um, and so things, things from there, they, they go south pretty quickly. There's no need to like build up to that or anything or, you know, try to pretend that it isn't any, isn't that way. Um, it turns out that selling fruit is just a, a geist or a euphemism for committing burglary, right? And so Reinhold and Mech turn out to be criminals and, and France has now officially been thrown into a, a life of crime once more. And it's the thing he feared the most. It's the thing he's been trying to avoid uh, ever since the start of the series, right? Since before the start of the series even. Um, and it doesn't go well. Uh, the others treat him terribly during the, the crime itself. Um, uh, Reinhold physically punches him and the others berate him and give him a really hard time. Uh, and it's it's only by the skin of his teeth that Franz manages to to move along with the rest of the crew and get out of there in, in relatively one piece, right? And uh, Mech drives them off in a car, right? But but as they're going along their escape route, uh, there, there's this couple in another car behind them that begin to tail him, tail, tail them, tail Mech in the car, because um, just for whatever reason, out of nowhere, uh, you know, it was just random bad timing. Um, the driver's wife in the pre in the other car, it's a couple, and the wife um, just so happened to challenge the driver to to race the the car in front of them, which is you know full of burglars and stolen goods and stuff, um, to, to try to see who's faster or whatever. She she eggs them on to like be competitive, do like a little, little weird street race or whatever, and um, and the the pressure from this it stresses Reinhold out to the point where he cracks. And his conflict with Franz makes it a little easier for him to just sort of, you know, sacrifice Franz for the, the group or whatever, right? And so he, he throws Franz, he shoves him out of the back of the car as it's driving along, you know, as a sort of sacrifice or roadblock to the car behind them. And um, from there, yeah, uh, both Reinhold and Mech believe Franz has been run over by the chasing car and is now dead. So they presume him to be dead because he got thrown out. And um, they think that the car behind him ran him over. Um, and so because of this, uh, Mech tells Silly and uh, Silly that she tells Silly, he tells, he tells Silly that uh, Franz is now dead. And uh, she panics and ends up uh, sort of slipping back into a weird relationship with Reinhold uh, as a result. And they end up having sex in the men's room at the bar. Um, but however, in actuality, um, Franz did survive the, uh, being thrown out of the car. Uh, but his hand was run over by the other car in the process. He didn't get run over himself. It wasn't a you know from head to the torso where it would have been fatal. It was just the the car was aligned just so that it only ran over his like left or right hand, right. And so, um, but you know that still hurts. Obviously, that still does a lot of damage. And so he's in he's in a state of delusional shock. And um, the episode it, it basically it ends with a a lengthy scene. In which Reinhold um, abuses and, and throws Trudy or Trude out of his apartment in favor of uh, spending the night uh, with, um, with Silly. So he replaces Trude with Silly after all, uh, and she's okay with it, I guess, because she's been through the routine before or whatever. She's used to it, maybe. Um, but the Trude is, you know, gone now, basically. Uh, and Franz, Franz is in the car, being driven to a random address in Berlin that the uh, that he provided the driver with. Right, the driver agrees to drive him to drive him to this this place that he asks to be driven to, um, you know, an apartment presumably, and uh, and the narrator ends up he, the narrator himself actually speaks directly with the viewer in the final scene, telling us that there is um, there is no cause for despair, no cause for despair, when it comes to um, what has been happening to all of the characters uh, in the story so far and what will eventually happen to them. Um, and we can assume from this that the story will not have a happy ending. Uh, it's clearly foreshadowing for later, uh, perhaps. But we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. Um, is there anything I missed from the, the summary, Simone? Anything you'd like to add? None. Cool. So um, I just have a couple of notes over here I wanted to add. My prediction, by the way, um, with, relation, with regards to like... Uh, the, the address that he that Franz gives at the end, I have a feeling that it might be uh, Ava's apartment, right? So we might see Ava sort of, you know, there is another, you know, again playing her role as the hooker with a heart of gold, right? The uh, the you know the um, 
the angel in the darkness for friends, right? She might nurse him back to health. But my prediction is that that's where he uh, wants to be sent uh, when he when he's to recover, basically. But we'll see. We'll see. So um, as always, Simone, uh, we always usher in our, our discussions with uh, this very first uh, famous question. And so um, what I want to know is, uh, what would you rate this episode out of 10 and why? I'll give it a 7.5, uh, between 7.5 and an 8. Uh, as I'm trying to grab so what really happened in this one, there are a lot of things that happened. And I'm sort of trying to figure out or getting back to each scene if it's, if it's in, uh, if each scene executed properly or, um, is it, uh, does it coherent with each other or, uh, does it make the show as a whole to make these, uh, just as you mentioned, the foreshadowing, uh, another team to, for, for it to buckle up the, the, the upcoming episodes that we will cover in the future or how will this, um, particular episode will be essential or important to the uh, to the following ser- series of events. Yeah, you know, there's there's something interesting about this episode. I mean, it, it's much more ambiguous compared to a lot of the other ones, right? Like, it's there are moments where it's like it's hard to tell what's really going on, not because it's told badly or that it's confusing in like a ba- in a negative way, as in an incompetent way, but it's more it's like this one really walks the line between realism and surrealism or or the abstract or whatever it's very stream of consciousness is what i noticed i mean there are a lot of you know franz says a lot of weird shit he does a lot of weird monologues and that's something else i noticed too that i haven't noticed before is that the way that he talks to himself in the the movie so far or in the the series so far it's a lot like how you know we've, we've seen plays together on this this channel we've covered them right it's a lot like how a a an actor on a stage play right? Like in, in Hamlet or something, it's like how Hamlet would talk to himself and no one around them really acknowledged the fact that they're talking to themselves. It's sort of just, it's normal. No one ever stops and goes, you're kind of weird. Why are you, why are you, why are you sitting there muttering things to yourself? It's like, no, it doesn't seem to be set within the actual present moment or reality. You know, it seems to be detached from it. It seems to be a, a sort of, you know, like an artistic flair or flourish or like a literary device or something thrown into the actual series itself. It's interesting. It's it's almost as if it's not happening at all, but it is, right? It's almost as if, you know, he's just thinking in his mind, but it's being articulated to us and presented to us as the viewers, you know, in a way that makes it seem as though he's just standing in the middle of the street talking to himself. But then there are times where he does talk to himself and, and people are listening and paying attention. So it's confusing. You know, there's this, it's not, I, I wouldn't say confusing is not the right word for it. It's disorienting, right? Because it's intentional. It's a deliberate, you know, uh, effort on the, the creator's part to, to make us feel weird about this stuff because there's no clear cut answer one way or the other. There's, it, it muddies the waters a little bit and it makes that, that makes it interesting, I would say. Um, and so for that, for that, I, I would give it, um, a nine. I, I, I liked this episode a lot. I, I, I actually, I do think it's the best one in the series so far, but, um, that being said, I don't think it's too special for something at this point. I don't think it's really special for like, one episode to be better than the other because I just I think the the deeper you get into it, the more you're going to enjoy it, and the more that the, the more there, there's going to be more there, right? Because it, there's going to be more that has been built off of, right? I mean, the, it's like each episode is it's like a Jenga block or whatever, you know? It's like you had the base, now you have you know the first floor, the second floor, third floor. It's like now we're on the the sixth, and it, you know things you can see things a little more clearly from up here, um, and there, there's just there's more to see. The view is wider. And so, you know, the disorienting parts are interesting. They complement the, the realistic parts um, in a way that we haven't quite seen yet up until this point. Um, although I, I will say I, I am a bit irritated, just as a side note. I didn't think the episode was lacking necessarily. I, I didn't think it was incomplete. But um, I am a bit, not not like annoyed or anything, but just a bit like rankled, I guess, that it ended on such a dramatic cliffhanger. You know, because now it's like, now I want to see what happens in part seven as soon as possible. And, um, and just in general, like we're, we're already nearly halfway through the series already, you know, soon we'll be, the next episode we'll be covering will be episode seven of 14, you know, so we're 50%, we're almost at the the halfway mark. Right. And, um, and while I, I will say this, while a lot of incidents, like, you know, sort of little events here and there have happened, uh, so far, it's still hard to tell if anything, you know, I guess overly significant 
has happened within the context of the overall narrative so far, if you know what I mean. It's hard to say, uh, you know, how things are going when you um, you don't know what to expect and you, you have no idea what's right around the corner, right? And, um, you know, to me, the, the quality of the story gets better and better with, um, with every new uh, installment because things build off one another, like I said before. They become more intricate as time goes by. And, um, and, and it was weird because I, you know, like I've said in, in the previous, you know, previous episodes of this, you know, um, Franz, he changes, he's a different person in every single part. Right. And it was, it was really interesting because in this part, I, I gotta be honest, I felt bad for, for Franz. You know, I, I felt a lot of sympathy for him. And I also felt as though, um, Reinhold, Reinhold as a character, he really came into his own, you know, he's a, he's a despicable character. Like he's a bad guy, but, um, He's more fleshed out, and I can. I, I, it's more. It's easier to tell what his role in the story is, and like why he's around. Because, you know, in the previous episode when he was introduced, I, I said it like this. I thought it was like weird fan fiction almost. It's, you just have this random person show up out of nowhere. Everybody likes them. He's weird and mysterious. You know, it's like it was. It just felt a little off. But now, now that we've seen the the, the consequences of his actions, now that we've seen his his true colors, you know, his dark side, right? Which is his real side, let's be honest. We saw it in the previous episode, but now now things have gone bad between him and um, friends, and that actually makes him more interesting is when he's an enemy or whatever, you know? It's weird, but he, he's had a bit of an arc already. In just two episodes, he's already had, like, a, a whole journey, right? Personally, as a character. Um, but yeah, those are, those are all the good things about this episode, but um, I, I would say the downside is that... Um, this clearly isn't the end of the situations that have been established in this within this episode. Um, there's much more to come, and I'm keen to see what the re direction they decide to take. Um, and maybe it's not a it, it's not necessarily a negative, but I, I just think it's you know it's kind of you know it's just a mild irritation. It's not a big deal, but it's like uh, this is the first episode that's been an outright that's featured an outright cliffhanger at the very end, right? Because every other one so far, like. Again, I don't think this is an incomplete story. I just, I, I liked the other parts because they sort of had a, a clear beginning and end, you know, and this feels like a two-parter within a 14-part series. It's just a little, you know, it's kind of like, come on, I, I, I would like to see a little bit of resolution because it's what they've set, it's the, the precedent they've set with all the other previous episodes. This first one, this, the seventh, the sixth one, sorry, goes against that trend and it's just a little... It can be a little disrupting at times, but you know, that's the, that's the point. And so I, I get it, but it's just, it's like, eh, maybe I'm just a little too tired for it. I don't know. It kind of irritated me, but that, that's the only, that's the only real downside I can see to this episode in general. Also, maybe just how convenient it was that the uh, car behind the car that was full of stolen goods just so happened to uh, randomly follow them. You know, I thought that was a bit um, too easy an excuse for the writers to come up with, you know? It just, it felt a little cheap, but other than that, I could get over it because I, uh, you know, I liked how they, they followed it. You know, I liked how the, because that was an interesting dynamic with the, the wife and the husband. The husband was, you know, he was delegating everything to the wife and the wife was um, very, very cold and, and kind of cruel and, and you know, um, self-serving in it because they ran, they, you know, they thought they'd killed friends, right? And they were just, you know, the wife was just willing to leave him there because she didn't want to get involved with the police or whatever it was it was inter it was really brutal you know it's like it goes to show how ruthless um it's a demonstration of how ruthless human beings can be you know how ruthless human nature can be unforgiving i guess or whatever you know unsympathetic or whatever you know um and i'm sure that happens a lot i'm sure people you know you hear about hit and runs all the time on the news or whatever right it's like someone just gets run over because you know the driver's not paying attention or whatever and then they just they keep going they just keep going because they hope they don't get caught and a lot of the time they don't you know, because the license plates don't happen to be, you know, they, they don't get caught on the, the, the street lights or whatever. You know, it's just it, they, they get away with it a lot of the time. And then the, a person's either crippled or, or dead or just otherwise just, you know, hurt. I mean, it's probably not very fun to get run over by a car, you know. So that, that it's very true to life. And it was very poignant. And I, I liked it. It was a nice little moment that they had. Um, but yeah, uh, there's much more to come, obviously, in the, in the series overall. And I'm, I'm keen to see what direction they decide to take and go in, um, and, uh, and yeah. Anything you'd like to add to that, uh, Simone?
Yeah, it is. Episode, I, I guess every episode uh, is really different from each other. Uh, aside from the fact that Branch is also different from every episode, but I think they use different approach with each episode that we've seen so far. A different kind of experimentation, or they add a different approach or a particular element to try to to make things work. I guess, and this one is just it's really different. That's why it's just uh, I hope this. I think that's the purpose of this conversation is to really get into those. Why is it uh, just to mention that it's been irritating how how it ends and some of the some of the events or scenarios. It seems like that it doesn't really happen, or it's more on stream of consciousness things, and that really is. And aside from it, it's just, uh, I agree with how sympathetic that we've been to France or how she, how he is viewed in this one. Uh, I get it now. Maybe those particular elements or particular traits might be, I saw it in some particular episode that we covered so far to be act that way sympathetic, but now it's, we got a reason, a concrete reason why why we need to be sympathetic over him or I mean to be that way to understand him because uh, uh, for example to compare it with some uh, uh, there might be and uh, the protagonist in this one might be uh, Reynold and then it what uh, what makes uh, Frank, Frank's um, effective character is that you can compare and contrast the both character and also to look back at to some episodes that we covered so far yeah yeah and um you know i i think the way that they characterize friends throughout the entire series you know so far it's a lot it's very true to life i think it's very realistic actually because um i don't know just think about any person that you know right it's like you know from week to week you might have completely different you know feelings about them or whatever it's like um it just depends, you know. Things, the, the, your feelings change, or whatever. Your at your your attitude, your view of that person, cha- it, it grows and develops. It, it um, goes through all these twists and turns and stuff, just depending on whatever, right? It's like maybe my friend at school. I like them one week because they, you know, helped me out with the, you know, some homework or something. They gave me the answers, and I was really grateful for that because um, I didn't do the homework or whatever. I like them a lot that week. But then maybe the the week after that, they're just annoying as fuck because like they're just, I don't know, they're obsessed with some weird bit of gossip or they're just there. They've got like some really annoying obsession or something. And they're just like, you know, they're just talking my ear off about it. I might not like them as much that week. I might think of them as a completely different person. You know, you know, last week they were charitable and, and, you know, whatever. This week they're they're a pest. You know, they're very, very immature. And it just depends. It depends on how you're feeling. It depends on what's going on externally and it depends on just all of that right i feel like with friends it's it's the same way right it's like you know last time he did really shitty things with the you know he got himself involved with this whole mess with with reinald and it made him really like unsavory as a person i mean in the first episode you know the way he treats the you know his dead sister's wife we killed by the way he killed the he killed his wife or i mean you know his his dead wife's sister sorry he killed his wife and then he he goes and like forces himself onto the, uh, you know, um, the, the, the sister and it's a mess. It's, it's like, he's a terrible, he's a monster. You know, he's, he's a fucking, he's a, he's a predator at that point. He's, uh, he's not, he's not, he's not great. You know, it's not a great look for him or whatever. Um, but then things, so many things happen. So many things change. We see so many different sides of him, you know, he's very multifaceted. I mean, he's not a very smart guy when it comes down to it. He's big and bulky and kind of dumb and just like a, like a kid, you know, but He's got a lot of layers to him, and there are, there are a lot of different ways that you can twist and turn him to make him look different. It's like it just depends on how the light shines on him on any particular, on any given day. It's interesting, you know. And I, I would say that in this episode, he was at his most sympathetic because he really was thrown into a situation that he had, you know, no control over. And he just, he really does want to be better. He really does want to be good and stable and conventional and just an ordinary guy, you know, average Joe, just working for his money and, and having his girlfriend and just living the, the, the decent humble life. Right. But that's all being ruined constantly by stupid bullshit, you know? And this is the, the, this episode really kind of 
highlights that theme of, of how unlucky he is just in general, you know. So, um, yeah, I liked it. I thought that was, I thought that was good. It's, you know, it's, you can tell that something is effective when it can be written so well as to make you feel all these different things about one single character, you know, to, to make you see him in so many different ways. I mean, that's effective, you know, that's powerful. It's, it's really, it's really, it's a mark of really good writing. And so I have to, you know, I have to give it credit. I have to give credit where credit's due and all that. Right. So, um, you know, like we said at the start of this, uh, episode, right, Simone, um, it's, there's a lot of stream of consciousness, sort of experimental, or I guess surreal stuff, surreal imagery, surreal moments. And so I, one of the first ones of this, it, you know, it, it's like, we, like I mentioned in the summary, um, Franz's dream about the snake at the, at the start of the episode. Um, Simone, what did you think of all of that? Uh, what does it mean? What does it, you know, do in the episode as a whole? Uh, just what are your general thoughts regarding the, uh, the snake dream? Yeah, I see it connected with the other uh, narratives that take place. For example, there are some they use um, this particular when and a scene is taking place, and there there's a nar- narration that telling some uh, weird uh, trivia uh, regard that which not might be related to what is happening. Uh, just to position as you mentioned before. Uh, I see this one, and there are, to look back at those parts, it's just mentioned that there's um, the story of Genesis and other things that take place that are related to the Bible. And I saw this episode um, similar to that one when Adam and Eve was offered uh, uh, the fruit, which will gain them consciousness about everything and whatnot. And that might be it. That might be that dream is all about, but there are other particular elements that into it that it's not just it. It's not just one particular event that we can see similar to this. But his actual reaction to what are those things, what might be those other elements or shape-shifting things that take place. Yeah, it's weird. As you mentioned, it's surreal. And, and the... It's as... Uh, when the particular scene takes place, it's just, uh, you didn't understand that much of it. It just might be some weird narrative again, but getting back on how watching the shows go, it's just, oh, it can be related to this one. Oh, it might be really a sign or maybe something just, just uh, a deja vu or whatever that might take place that it's might be giving you signs or warning to what to act or things that you shouldn't do, but it's make this whole episode effective, I guess, especially in how it ends. There might be a connection with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, it's a harking, you know, it seems like it is a thematic sort of callback to, um, Oh, Adam and Eve parable, right? Because it's like, I mean, uh, Reinhold has clearly been established as like a, a fair weather friend kind of. It's like the moment that uh Franz disagrees with him, decides not to help him in his weird way, you know, not to indulge his weird little, you know, uh, psychosis or whatever. Even though it's something that Reinhold clearly doesn't like about himself. I mean, he wanted help last time with the whole Salvation Army thing. It's like, well, no, it's not, you know, he's too fucked up. He's it's probably too late for him. He's too messed up. He's too deep into it, you know. And so yeah, I mean, he just there. He's he's gone, kind of off now. It's it's over, you know. It's like the relationship is soured, um, and and you know they say about dreams, it's like your subconscious trying to tell your consciousness what it doesn't want to hear or whatever, right? And I, I feel like that was a, a perfect um, kind of example of that, you know, as a moment. It was you know, it's like Franz still wants to like. Um, Reinhold, even though he knows he's flawed, even though he knows that he doesn't like him very much, you know, he's mad at him or whatever, he still wants, like, a chance to, to be friends with him and, and have things be, you know, normal, normal, quote-unquote, you know, or relatively stable or whatever. But um, it's not going to go back to being that way, and I think that's what his brain was trying to tell him, right? And so, you know, it was a nice little clever way of conveying that, not only to himself, but to the, obviously, to the, the audience in general as well. Um, 
that's just another one of those things that kind of muddies the waters, blurs the lines a little bit between what's real and what isn't. Um, and so going off of that, I mean, there's another example uh, immediately after of this stream of consciousness element in the episode that, that was prevalent throughout the episode, right? So, Simone, let me ask you this. Um, why, did, why did Franz think that there were, that there were bells ringing outside? And, um, and how, did that, how did him thinking that lead him to, uh, to run into Bruno in the street? which then led him to visiting Pums. I mean, is the universe controlling his destiny now all of a sudden? Or is, the, is it his subconscious guiding him to where he needs to go? Or, you know, what, what's going on there? What's, what's the deal, do you think? Uh, I think somehow a sort of uh, a challenge or some warning to test him out to test what's how the, his fate will work, really. It just, it was portrayed in other videos that I saw before. Uh, but it's a different consequences or different sense of scenarios that might take place. But in this one, it's just like, uh, there might be, or that it's not exactly the, the scenario that he witnessed is the, what the bell is all about. It might be the preceding act uh, events that take place after he he did that or there might be a a mass or whatever that's it uh, we can interpret it this, this particular in, in a lot of ways a lot of maybe a wake up call for him or maybe to to be able to him to see what's really it is all about to look at not only on the outside that is taking place but uh, a more of an internal action but it's just he's able um uh, if he didn't or he just sit around all all day long thinking about what his what his dream is all about he might be able to cross the line between the his subconsciousness and consciousness um uh, to get what all these people is all about especially uh Reynold. but i don't know things works it's it's an element that it's that to be needed to, to happen. This particular scenario I needed to be having just like when you have some sort of uh deja vu or uh it seems like I did you mention that uh, our subconsciousness are telling us to be conscious about things but we tend to neglect those but when we come up to the uh realization it's like that oh I shouldn't do this one, I shouldn't do this. Uh so that's how I see it. I, how those perspectives. Yeah, and I, I think the key to all of that is sort of um, the notion of like, uh, let's say, repression. Right? It's like you when you repress or when you suppress something, when you try to like push it down deeper and deeper into yourself without addressing it. It's like um, you know, it's like if you, it's like if you just keep stuffing laundry into your your laundry basket without actually washing it. It's like. You're, the clothes aren't going to magically like wash themselves or whatever. It's going to get to a point where the basket overflows. The only way you can get rid of the, the laundry is by either, you know, I don't know, throwing it away, setting it on fire, but usually by washing it, right? Taking the cl time to clean it so that there's clean laundry. But it's like, if you just, if you just stack up all your dirty laundry and try to forget about it or whatever, ain't going to get you very far. You know, it's like, you know, it's like I've said, I've made this analogy before, right? It's like, um, you know, it's like when, when you, clean your room but you really just shove all your shit into your closet or underneath your bed or whatever it's like the mess is still there you haven't sorted through everything you haven't taken everything out folded every shirt thrown away every piece of loose leaf paper that you don't need anymore you know like you haven't done that yet you haven't done the real work so the real mess is, is still there um yeah it's not good and I, I think that's where a lot of this stuff comes from it's like you know i i don't think there's a i don't think it's a coincidence why people tend to dream about, you know, the things that sort of affect them the most in some way or the other, right? It's like if you're having a, a fear-based dream where you're falling out of the sky or you're, you know, you're stranded in the middle of nowhere or you don't have any clothes on or whatever, all the typical kind of cliched nightmare dream, you know, nightmare sequences or whatever. It's like those are, those tap into what gets you the most, right? It's just, it's one of those things. It's one of those, you know, ancient human things. I don't know. Maybe it's a, Maybe we have dreams to kind of toughen ourselves up against, you know, whatever. Maybe maybe our subconscious is trying to force us to face our fears. Because that's I think that's a lot of what it comes down to, right? It's like 
we know we in real in reality we we get that like we can't put up we can't deal with this shit anymore you know whatever it is it's like if we're really pissed off about something if we're really depressed about something if we're really scared about something it's like there's a part of us the real part of us that just can't handle that but our consciousness you know our conscious state or whatever it's like it makes it so that we can deny that we can pretend that it's not there we can come up with all sorts of excuses to avoid dealing with it but when we're asleep our real self comes out and we're defenseless against it and it forces us to just confront that thing take it on you know take it take it head on i mean one on one you know i i think that's what it comes down to it's just more direct contact with the things that we choose to ignore when we can and then when we can't you know that's when the you know the real part the the i guess realer part of ourselves swoops in and takes care of it for us or at least tries to does what it can i guess but it's a weird dynamic but I, I think it's interesting it's like we have two selves you know and and one self can be much more stubborn than the other you know and then sometimes the other needs to step in and be like the older brother or something and just you know do what needs to be done whether it's pleasant or not it's you know maybe our subconscious selves our subconscious self it may not necessarily be the hero that we uh, that we uh deserve but it's certainly the hero that we need and all that right so or vice versa but um so then those are those are two of the stream of consciousness elements in this particular episode and they're followed by a third one uh so simone what did you what did what did you think of the uh the, the black water metaphor that the narrator repeats uh multiple times as a motif uh throughout the episode uh for example in the in the car scene with friends and reinald uh friends seems to be telling himself like you know I am a, I am, I am a lake in a forest. I am still, I am calm. All of this chaos is happening around me, but I still, I stand still and constant. I stand my ground. I don't, you know, move or whatever. What, what, what does that have to do with the, the episode overall and everything? Like, what is it, what is it there for? What does it mean? Uh, is it a way it's just his consciousness is talking to himself or maybe an internal battle that he's having that uh, I need to come down. I need to be here. It's not actually the way that I should do it, but uh, but it's not really happening or not exactly not happening, but he's not really able to do what he's, what the thing is inside of his mind. It's just some things are, might go in a different way or it is uh, just like, getting back to some episode this is to uh a wake-up call or some sort of mantras that he plays all over uh to himself just uh don't worry about it don't do such thing or for for yourself for yourself to come down or to be able to look at what the particular scenario is is all about to be exactly in the moment to be conscious to be to be able to see things clearly, but you're really in the, in the verge of agony, or there are a lot of things that are taking place, but you're not able to really see what's what's real, or you're confused what's what's illusion, and it's not. You're trying to look for your direction, but not really able to do it. But I guess that in this particular episode. He's able to do what he really needed to do. He's he's able to have his own say or to have his own to be uh to have a full control of himself to to stand on what he really believes in, which is makes him favorable character. Because he's not easily swayed by things that are taking place in his immediate environment. Yeah. Yeah, you know. I think it's a, a very creative way of letting the audience know that um, Franz is, is trying. You know, he's trying. He really is doing his best to, like, stay on the straight and narrow and all that and be, be a good person, be better after, uh, you know, beating his wife to death with a comb brush uh, and spending four years in jail because of it. He's trying to live a much better second life or whatever, but it's not, it's not too easy, you know. But he's he's resisting, and and that's that's really what it is. It's it's a monologue of resistance. You know, it's a poem of resistance almost. Because it, it is almost like a poem. You know, it's a poem of resistance. That's what I would say. That's what I would say. And I I like that they you know they can they can convey these things without just spelling it out. You know, 
I like the indirectness with which they, you know, the indirect approach that they're taking. Um, it's not, it's never overwhelming. It's never too much, but, um, I would say in this episode, it's a little different than, you know, what we've seen. It's a different breed, this sort of stream of consciousness that we see here. And, um, I don't know. I, I wonder, I wonder if they can, they can do more with it in the future because it's like right now they've, they've established it, but I don't know if they've gone as far as they possibly can with it. So I, I'd like to see more. They've, they've left room for it to evolve, I guess, and have a little, even more impact, even more power. Right. So, cause right now it's just, it's like mildly interesting, but there's nothing, there's no heavy hitters so far. So I, what I want to see in, in future episodes is a heavy hitter. One of these heavy hitting like stream of consciousness slash like abstract moments. I want it to, deliver a punch unlike any other almost you know now that's just kind of how i feel about it but um uh i guess highlight of this episode uh simone kind of the crux of everything um what did you think of the uh what did you think of the burglary scene yeah, he is really caught up in the moment that actually the thing that he is i think uh, another uh, aspect or character of him that makes him really vulnerable is just he's he's naive. He is he really don't know what's what's really happening or he's really into something. It's just disconnected at some point or because he uh he's really take a lot of time in the jail or for four years and it's just like a, those particular set of events are still uh, blended into his character that he can really remove easily, but I guess now he's able to, uh, uh, little by little, but not actually in a full blast or in a big leap or step. Uh, he, he knows that the thing that is happening is not really the thing that he wanted to do, but he, there are some signs that it's not actually the thing that he wanted, but he is na naive to see those uh, signals that he's not. He doesn't need to get involved in this, but he's denying or he's trying to to get disconnected through all this temptation. Not exactly temptation, but uh, things that might probably against his uh, perspective, but also not the thing that he. That he's just not think that morally right or the direction that he wanted to have, uh, but he can just cut off his friends or cut off Mac or just uh, dodge all the questions that are related to this one to not be really to remove all the possibilities or the probability that he'll he'll get in, involved in this one. But he didn't. He he just let things to happen. But he doesn't really let things happen but it's just he failed to uh analyze its thing that to get really away from this trouble yeah i mean he doesn't you know he doesn't take enough of a stand or whatever he doesn't do enough to make his life a bit better to get rid of these bad influences to just say fuck it and and you know just move on and radically change it's like he's still holding on to something you know he still wants his old friends, you know, Mex is old, his lifelong friend or whatever. He wants to see the good in him, even though he knows now that he's a you know criminal and all that. Even though he knows now that he pretty much left him for dead, right? Like, uh, same with Reinald. It's like he, want, he just wants to see the good in people, which is, you know, it's funny because obviously there's a lot of not good in him. And so maybe it's, maybe it has something to do with like, you know, the golden rule or something. Maybe he, there's a part of him that like hopes that if he, treats other people with as much dignity and kindness as possible or whatever, maybe that'll bounce back his way and, and people will forgive him for his sins basically or whatever, you know, but, um, there's, it's weird. It's, yeah, it's weird. And, and it's like, he doesn't try hard enough. He doesn't do enough or he, what he does do is wrong. It's not the right answer. And he just doesn't, doesn't seem like he knows he's not well equipped enough to, um, to have a strong enough defense against these things to keep them from influencing him in one form or another right to a certain degree basically whatever it is but um yeah and so uh simone why do you think reinald pushed franz out of the the car was it because he was so freaked out about the people behind them or was it you know like a, a an opportunistic kind of just 
random heat of the moment thing or or was it you know was it to get revenge for um you know pulling out of the deal or whatever the weird agreement that the two of them had or was it like a mixture of some of those or all of them or none of them or or, or where do you stand on that whole thing you know why did why did uh why did Reinhold push friends Yeah, now he's able to see uh, whose branch it is, or he's able to. Um, in the particular scene, there, the, in, in the scene of the burglary, uh, he's able to. He's almost frightened, or he's almost freaked out when he's when he see uh, something in uh, something a wake up call for him, or signals that might probably might set him into the danger that. Uh, Put him in danger. I'm um, getting back into the last question. I guess I I still I got some uh, insight for it. It's just it should be a wake up call for for France to what really is happening. That all his plans are leading him into the life that he really doesn't want to go to. The life that he's avoiding. That he's trying to accept these things, to deny these things, to be able to live to accept his friends but it's not actually the thing it's not what he really wants but he's he's in the denial of seeing what the reality is that uh what it's really all about it's just uh sorry about the fact that there's a lot of things that take taken place out here but and uh, that also leads to uh the scene where he when Reiner, Reinhold uh, punches uh, punches uh, France on the act of burglary. I think he is really capable of trying to eliminate France in in other way. He's convinced, or it's another objective that gets into his mind to eliminate him. But he can just do that in that particular moment because they might get caught and other consequences that they might face. But I guess the the reason for him to uh to push trans away is not actually aside from the fact that they think that they are being followed that they that people know that they are acts of burglary but another is just he has a personal grudge or whatever to France and then doing that he's able to fix one problem in I uh, two problems in one. With one stone. Yeah, two birds with one stone and all that. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, do you think he, do you think he felt guilty for, uh, cause he, he actually thought that he killed friends there. Like, do you think he felt bad? Like, do you think he was traumatized by it or is there no remorse? Do you think? Yes, he got a little remorse, but not exactly to the point that you will call it to remorse. He might say that, oh, oh what I did is wrong, but he used that particular scenario to do his other deed, to, to do what he really wanted or how his character is really bad. For example, in the when they did something, uh, when he get back to to Silly to take this opportunity to get her back to do all his evil deeds and whatnot. It's just a way for him to be free. Um, yeah. Aside from the reality that Francis seems like to, he's, it's he's helping him to be able to get out of his troubles. But in that scene, or there, he comes into the realization that France might not be the friend that he saw in the first place or it's not really the help that he wanted but somehow that will put him into the danger or because in the other scenes in this episode France is trying to live in a better life in a better uh, future person to fix himself this is how he signaled it in the last episode but it's not really what he wanted no I also, I think it's interesting, by the way, like, I, I feel like it's very accurate to the time in which it is set that, um, you know, they, they would, they would think, like, I don't think it's unrealistic for Mech and, um, Mech and, uh, Reinhold to assume that they killed, um, 
friends right then and there because you know the automobile at the time was still relatively new right so like i don't know i i, I don't feel like a car like that could actually i don't know anything about it but it's like you know just speaking as a casual observer or whatever, it's like, I, I don't feel as though a car like that could actually kill someone, you know, by running, the, even if they ran them over properly. Like, uh, so it's, you know, the, the naivety or whatever that's there, it's bad, you know, it's kind of, it's it creates a lot of problems, but it's, it's interesting, it's palpable. From a narrative perspective, it really puts you in place, it puts you into the environment. And it's just little, little things like that, that bring the world to life, you know, it, it makes it special. And I, I felt like that was a, you know, it was, it was a minor highlight, very minor highlight, but a highlight nonetheless, I think. Um, and I, and as, as far as um, Reinhold being guilty for um, killing friends or whatever, it's like, I, I don't know. You know, I uh, I think he was, you know, I think he was messed up. I think it messed him up. I think that's why he was, you know, that's why he took Silly back. I doubt he would have had her if um, nothing had happened. You know, he would have just broken up with Trude and continued the cycle he still picked her out and everything, but it's like, I also feel like in that ending scene, the final, one of the final scenes where he, you know, it's this very extended sequence where he, you know, he brutally like, you know, throws her around, humiliates her, degrades her, tries to get her to leave, you know, and, and then throws her out, just physically tosses her out. And she's loyal the whole time through. It's, it's weird, man. Um, and, uh, yeah, I felt like he was really, fucked up there I, like, I felt like even worse than how he usually would be it's like he he wanted he was well he wanted to he had to take something out you know he had he had something on his mind and I think it was obviously the fact that he thought that he killed friends so I, I think it got to him I think it got to him and I think it made things worse you know he didn't handle it well at all it just it, it only exacerbated the situations that were already there but um yeah I do think he felt guilty or he, he felt like he committed a sin you know I don't know if he felt bad, but he certainly felt guilty, if that makes sense. Because I think there's a difference. Um, I think he cared more about the fact that he fucked up more so than, you know, that Franz was dead, maybe. Possibly. I'm not sure. Um, but he acted a lot like, you know, someone like, I don't know, like Raskolnikov from uh, Crime and Punishment there. You know, very sort of like, uh, very emotional, very like like when you pin an animal in a corner, right? It's like there, there's this whole, it's very desperate, it's very extreme, fatalistic. Right, I either die here or I, I, I kill. You know, it's it's do or die sort of. It, do or die, right? Do or die, kill or be killed. That's how I felt that that last scene played out, and I feel like a, a contributing, a major contributing factor as to why he was acting that way was was obviously probably the fact that he thought that he'd killed um, this person that he'd known, you know, this friend or this ex friend or however he saw him at that point. But um, and I guess that leads directly into our next question. Um, you know, Simone, what did what did you think of the the scene where Reinhold throws Trude out in favor of Silly. It's a very long, very interesting sequence, so, so I, I want to know what your opinion on it is. That's also, it seems like, uh, let's say I said that I see a little remorse or a guilt with uh, in Reinhold's uh, character to what has happened, but in this way, he's trying to justify that what he did is actually true, or he's denying the fact that he did something terrible. He's able to, he's looking that uh, I eliminated, that I, uh, now that Bieber Cup or France is gone, that I, now I, uh, even though he's gone, I'm still able to do what he's, I don't need him anymore. It's just, if, uh, now that he's gone, I still able to live on my own to do the things that I asked him to do. But uh, and also maybe saying to himself that uh, why did I let Franz to do it if I can do these things alone? He's trying to justify all the things that Franz did good for him or the purpose for him to befriend Franz to be able to look at it that what he did is something that he won't really regret or yeah, it's just. That those are the things what he did to true is actually the thing that he wants Franz to do with all those girls that he mentioned or to he asked him to meet him but he's not he's afraid to do it but now he's able he become the pure maybe evil in this particular episode uh, his particular character that he's trying to avoid manifest in this one yeah 
Yeah, maybe it pushed him. It was the last thing he needed to sort of dehumanize him a little bit and just make him completely ruthless, you know, completely unemotional about the whole thing. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. It was kind of a hard scene to watch for me. Like, it was pretty rough. I don't know. It's probably one of the most disturbing scenes in the series so far. Like, it just goes on and on and on. And it's like, man, it kind of it delves right into the depths of uh, human nature and all that. It's pretty fucked. But um, effective, I will say effective, uh, certainly. But, um, you know, we're, we're pretty close to the end already. So, uh, uh, Simone, last like little bit of uh, stream of consciousness stuff. Um, what did you think of, what did you think of the, uh, of Franz's like dazed rant in the car at the very end of the episode, right? He's going on and on about how the sun's like bigger than the earth and how nothing really matters. It's, it's this nihilistic diatribe that pretty much everyone has their point in their life, right? Some point in their life, right? Like you, you get that moment, that epiphany where it's like, yes, everything will turn to dust. We'll all die. Everything ends and all that. We talked about it, you know, in the previous couple episodes of the show, in fact, because it came up earlier. Now it's back again. So um, what do you think of, of this last little bit uh, here, Simone? That's, uh, so from me, that it's really effective. That's, that's really the particular scenes that made me think that, uh, uh, that put us into the cliffhanger. This, this, uh, this particular scene, it, it really is. Uh, uh, those are the scenes to get back to what we covered in the last uh, episodes. Those are the scenes that made you really engage into what the story is to really uh, snippets or maybe sometimes in this episode I saw it uh, scope of who is really Peter Garfield or what's really life is all about. Aside from him, that to be able to put you in the situation to to be a lot of it, to be in his shoe. Actually, I also like how the reaction of the women, or, yeah, the women in this, uh, holding Beaver Cup in the, uh, it's just, he, she also, aside from France, who changed into his character to, his, changes his approach to be more sympathetic or to be more favorable character. There's also, we all change. It seems like that there's not really, uh, a pure evil character or whatnot, or, uh, as I said, it's just, Francis, in all episodes, he's really different, and so, how, it's also how the other characters are. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have much to say on it, but I was just curious what you had to say. Um, and, and then also, uh, I mean, going hand in hand with that, I think this is the, this slightly more interesting thing that comes from that very final scene. Right, right before the episode ends, um, Simone, what did you think of the uh, the the narrator commenting on the events of the episode and and telling the viewer that there is no cause for despair, right? No cause for despair. Uh, what what do you think that means, and why was it included at the the very end of the episode? What does it do? Why is it there? Um, maybe to justify what he said. Because he said that it's just said it's very nihilistic dialogue that it says everything will turn into dust that uh, things are really nothing. So that's maybe it is to see that nothing really matters at all, or at the end of the day, everything will not is meaningless or something. Right. I mean, he, he obviously arrives at that conclusion because he's been put through a lot. You know, I mean, it's not like he's. Happy. He's, it's not like he's saying all that because he's super happy, you know. So it's like it makes sense why he's, he's arrived at this state yeah. of mind and state of thinking, viewpoint, whatever. But um, you know, uh, uh, just generally speaking, um, what I think is a little more interesting is how the narrator directly communicates with the viewer in this one. You know, he might have done that before in some previous episodes, but here it's like he really, it's like there's a direct link, you know him to, to you or whatever, you know, just, just right there, right there. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he breaks the fourth wall is what I'm trying to say. It's very, it's meta, you know, he, he finally just jumps through the screen. Again, go back to the, the play thing, right? It's like, that's what plays do. You know, if there's a narrator in a play, it's, it might be a random character or it might be some dude or whatever just comes up, walks up to the, the center of the stage and just starts 
telling you what's going to happen next or whatever. You know, that it, that it felt like that, but in film form or in TV form, you know. Um, and I mean, obviously for me, it's like, it's just a, it's a portent of doom or whatever. It's probably, I don't know if Franz, Franz obviously isn't going to die from this. You know, he still has like, uh, you know, uh, what, what is it like eight more episodes to go or something? Yeah. Eight more episodes to go. He's fine for now, but, um, shit's going to get, what they've established is that things are only going to go downhill from here. And so we're, we're probably going to see even worse, uh, coming ahead. Not in terms of quality, but in terms of, you know, subject matter, whatever. It's going to be fucked, uh, I'm sure. By the very end, especially, I think things are going to be at an all-time low. Um, so that's what we have to look forward to, right? And I, I like that they kind of they foreshadow it right away because it makes you, you keen. It makes you interested to see where things will go next. But um, hey, other than that, we're, we're pretty much at the end of the discussion. So how I'll end things off with Simone is um, what I'll do is ask you uh, what, what do you think is going to happen in uh, in part seven? Do you have any predictions in particular or spitball a little bit? Uh, I thought that Eva doesn't show up in this episode. I didn't see her. Yeah. Or there's a particular scene that is significant uh, her to show up here. But So that might be, I might agree on the prediction that you mentioned earlier that the address that he uh, that, that told them to uh, to deliver him or to uh, get him to is probably the Eva because uh, there's no other characters that are mentioned or they uh, they talk or other friends that probably connected to Beaver Cup at this point that he might go to I guess yeah and then this particular uh, Prediction might be make this show is really interesting. It's like we're really expecting that we talk about in the other episodes that probably Eva is something that or someone that has a big role in this one. That even though she's just a few snippets and whatnot, there's a particular episode or a time for her to shine to do what she really needed to to, to be able to make things work. Yeah, and it's like, um, I mean, this is the first episode that she hasn't been in an episode, you know, so it's interesting. And so I have a feeling that the, the show is going to compensate for that by bringing him, by bringing her back and making her like the, maybe the main character of the next one. I don't know. Main character second to Friends, obviously. Friends is always going to be the central focus. I mean, that's what they've established, clearly. That could change, maybe, but like, you know, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, uh, my predictions are probably the same, right around the same lines. I don't like to do too much because I don't want to be wrong basically it would completely murder my ego i guess which needs constant uh feeding but um yeah i guess that that brings us to the end of our uh episode for today you guys uh an hour and two minutes so far it's what the stopwatch says anyway uh i didn't think we'd get to this point to be honest i'm really tired so uh you know i'm glad that we managed to kind of pull through and make something happen uh all in all simone how how do you think the discussion went? Went well? Went went you know okay? What are your feelings now that we're on the other end of it? Let's say. Uh, maybe we're not able to really do it the same way that we did in this particular episode. There are a lot of contexts that are taking place here, and also I think also in your end. But I guess we are able to give it justice of what we have. So. Yeah. And, um, I don't know, are you, uh, I, what I want to know is, um, hmm, just a little bit of housekeeping before we go, because, uh, I don't know, other people do it on their shows, so why, why can't we? Uh, what do, you, what do you think we should do when we get to episode seven, right? Because once we've done that, we'll be halfway through, like I said. Um, I don't know. Do you think we should would experience the entire thing, all 14 parts, kind of at once? Or would it be better to take a break now that we've, we're 50% of the way through? I want a second opinion on that because I, I don't think we should. I think we should just sit through the whole thing. I don't think it would take too much to do that. But um, what do you think? Do you think it would be better to watch something else, do like one episode break, you know, and then come back or uh, go the whole way through 100%? All eight remaining parts. Yeah, I guess I've been busy this last 
few days. And I think that's an upbreak for this show. But I mean, it's. I think that what you're saying is just we're going to cover a different one. But I don't think it's a good idea. This show is what makes this show is interesting. Is just we're really focusing it, and each episode is now that it's taking the different uh, path or way that they approach things. It might be really. As you mentioned, it's really interesting. It's just the seventh episode or halfway through. It might also le- um, ends in a cliffhanger. Yeah, and, and you know th- that's part of the fun. Like you said, it's um, tracking, tracing the the, the the changes, the progress from episode to episode. You kind of need to. It's not like it's 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 not hard to forget or whatever. I mean, it's not easy to forget. I guess it's it sticks out in your mind no matter what. But I just I think it would be to be as fresh and po- about fresh as possible and effective as possible. It'd probably be good to streamline the whole thing. You know, let's not let's not deviate too much. But yeah. Um, I'm glad we're on the same page about that. Other than that, Simone, uh, you know, good talk, good discussion, I think for, you know, it was a little bit of a different one, but everyone's been a different one. So it, it's good. Um, I'm probably going to get some sleep as soon as we're done recording this. So, uh, take care guys, uh, like, share, subscribe, comment, all that great stuff. And, uh, we'll see you in the next one. So, uh, take care and, uh, bye for now.